for the next few moments, I want to share with you on this theme, hostile takeover. We have been examining this theme. We've had two presentations on this thematic before. And we understand that we are dealing with the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment, we repeat it for affirmation of faith. And it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord did something. He blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, I want to affirm again this morning that the Sabbath is God's signature in his law. If you take the Ten Commandments and you go through them from Commandment 1 to Commandment 10, there is only one commandment in the list of ten that tells us the source of the commands. And so the Sabbath command identifies the source as the creator of heaven and earth. And any attempt to remove the fourth commandment from the Ten Commands leaves the law without its authority. In other words, if the House passed a piece of legislation and the Senate affirmed the piece of legislation and the legislation was sent over to the White House but the President never signed it, it would never become law because it's lacking the signature that puts the law into effect. If we remove the fourth commandment from the Ten Commands, it's lacking a signature. The Ten Commandments are all one package. You cannot then choose which of them you're going to pay attention to. It's all or nothing. So I'm going to ask you to come with me to Exodus chapter 15. And we are going to read together verses 24 through 27. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord, what? Showed him a tree, which when... Come on, are you there? Which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made them for a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them and said, what did he say? If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and what? Keep all his statutes. What did God promise? God made a promise. What was his promise? I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that doth something. What does he do? I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water, and threescore and ten palm trees. And they encamped there by the waters. I like the Exodus story because it's full of rich emotive themes. 
God had sent Moses down to Egypt. And Moses inquired of God, God, going down to Egypt is no ordinary thing to do. You know I fled Egypt as an ex-con. A murderer fleeing justice. And now you're asking me to go back to Egypt. Not only that, you're asking me not to go in undercover, but you want me to go up to the palace of the Pharaoh and go tell Pharaoh that you said to let your people go. I I've got a problem with the palace. But not only that, I also have a problem with the people. Because it was in defense of my people that I slew the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. And my people were the ones who made the thing known. Remember, Moses came on and saw these, this Egyptian beating up this Hebrew slave. And, you know, he struck him. I don't know he really intended to kill him. But in his wrath at seeing uh, one of his fellow Hebrews under the whip of the Egyptian, he slapped the guy real hard. And he never woke up. And so uh, Moses, trying to, to, to cover up the matter, dug the sand and buried the Egyptian. He looked left and he, that's not left. He looked left and he looked right and he saw no one. And he says, I got it done. You know, and he slipped away and... Went back to the palace as if everything was all right. But on another day, he was passing through the community. And he saw two Hebrews fighting. And he said, you know, you're brothers. You don't need to fight. Try to separate them. And one turned and looked at him and said, you, you know, who made you lord over us? You, you, you want to, to kill me like you killed the Egyptian and bury him in the sand? <laughs> Elder J says, the news, you know, Moses thought the deed was secured in his lockbox. But somebody hack it. There was a hacker in the house. <laughs> All of Moses' details were across the social media. And Moses realized he couldn't return to the palace because, you know, his Twitter feed lit up. <laughs> And he had to run off to Midian. He ran off to the wilderness. And for 40 years he was there. And here comes God saying, go back to Egypt. Not only that, you're going to go to the palace and you're going to lead your people out of Egypt. And Moses says, God, I've got a problem. When I get down to Egypt and they ask me, who sent you? What should I say? And he says, well, tell them the God of your fathers sent you. And tell them it's the God of your fathers who have sent you. He says, well, when they ask me what is his name, what shall I say unto them? And God said to Moses, just tell them I am that I am has sent you. God's name means something. Are you with me? God said to Moses, when you tell them what is the covenant name of God, when you declare the covenant, you see, you were not raised in the Hebrew community. You were raised in the Egyptian palace. So for them to hear you express the covenant name, it is to them a signal that I have spoken to you and that whatever else you have to say has come from me. You're not with me this morning. The locus of authority is God. And so Moses goes back to Egypt. And we know what happened. After the tenth plague had fallen on Egypt. Pharaoh was willing to let them go. God opened up the way. They marched out of Egypt. But you know, the devil is not going to quit. There are individuals who have started the walk with God. 
You know, you have come to that place where you believe that God is calling you to follow him and you have made up your mind to serve him and you got up, you got dressed and you went to the house of God and you said, I have turned a new page in my life. I have decided to follow Jesus. But deciding to follow Jesus does not mean that Pharaoh will quit. And so here they are, they march out of Egypt and uh, Pharaoh realizes, okay, my son is dead. And the next thing I did was to let all the slaves go. All the free labor that was underpinning the Egyptian economy just walked out through the gates. In other words, the Egyptian economy is going to take a severe hit. You have already destroyed the flocks and the herds and the vegetation and all kinds of things have happened. Now you have walked out with the free labor and on top of that, the message that went to the palace was the Israelites left on the weight. You know what I mean? Because God had said to them, go and ask of your neighbors, the Egyptians, whatever you need. And I have given you favor in their eyes. They will supply your needs. For 400 years, they had been under oppression. They had been there in Egypt as slaves. And slaves don't get paid. And so God decided to pay them when leaving. And you know, when I, when, when, I don't know if you have ever gotten uh, some accumulated back pay that you never expected. It feels... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So here they are, broke and burdened down. And they are about to leave Egypt to the wilderness. And what does God do? He dials up the calculator and says, you Egyptians, pay them. You're going to pay them every cent. Let me tell you, sometimes in your situation, in your circumstance, though it seems that you are where God wants you to be, it just seems as though you are under the oppression of circumstance. But let me tell you that God has a calculator and his calculator is accurate. And when God gets ready to open the doors and the windows and pour you out a blessing, not a devil in hell can stop it. And so when, when Pharaoh heard that the Israelites went up on the way, he knew what had happened. They had collected their salary. <laughs> and he says, you know, I'm, 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 I, I can't let all of that gold get up out of Egypt just like that. I'm, I'm going to go get those guys. And so he assembled his army. He was ashamed. He was embarrassed. How could it be that this, this, this guy without an army came into the land of mighty Pharaoh and took all his laborers out? raided the Egyptian economy and walked out full of gold. And I am the fear of Egypt. I'm going to stop them. And don't believe that because you're having a great experience with God, that the devil is just somewhere off saying, you know what happened? God is blessing him. I'm just over here. I'm not going to. No, 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 no. The devil is always after you. The Bible tells me that he walketh around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But I want you to understand that the angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him and it is he who delivers them. So they marched out. But God does something strange. He sends them not on the highway to Canaan but he sends them on a circuitous route that seemed to be a bridge to nowhere when I say that they took a turn off the highway and went off into a cul-de-sac and this was where God was leading them it's odd it was not like Moses was leading them without any divine direction God says this is the road you must follow and, and I, I can imagine that Moses must have been wondering, God, why not, why not that big pretty road over there? God says, this is the way. And when they got to the end of the route, there was the sea before them and mountains on both sides. I was like, hold a moment. 
You mean we marched all this way with all our family just to be hemmed in by this land, just to be locked up in this situation? I mean, this is the most defenseless situation you can be in. Mountains on either side, you can't, you can't clamber anywhere, you can't hide under anything. It's just solid mountains. And out there is the sea. And back there is the road to Egypt. And you know before too long, who was filling up the, back port, the, 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 the horizon, the back end of the picture? Pharaoh and his army. And the Israelites, they're terrified. They're like, Moses, would to God we had died in Egypt. You got to read uh, Exodus chapter 14. Would to God we had died in Egypt. You mean you came down here, you and your ex-convict self. And we were, we were eating onions and leeks and we were eating the fat cows of Egypt. Yes, they oppressed us, but at least we were eating and drinking. Now we are going to be murdered in the sand beside the sea. We and all our children hopelessly hamstrung because you took us on this foolhardy journey. Let me tell you something. There are many individuals who start the walk with God. And you're so happy. You know, you get baptized and the job open up. And you, this problem you are having here, all your problems just seem to get fixed. And the light is shining bright and you come into church and you're enjoying the worship service. And when we sing the song, your face light up. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know, thus set the Lord. And you know what happened? Boy, one day you turn up at the job and the boss says, you're going to need to show up here next Sabbath. You hear? Uh, we cannot give you Sabbaths off anymore. I say, yes, sir. But I thought we had an agreement. Yeah, but things change. And you, you're saying to yourself, well, God, how can that be? And you say, oh, oh, well, everything I asked the Lord for, he sorted it out. So you go home and you pray. And you go back to work. And the situation hasn't changed. And you come to prayer meeting and you ask all the brethren to pray. And it seems nothing has happened. And you know what happened? You lose the job. And now you can't pay the rent. And the pantry is almost empty. And somebody is saying to you, just tell God you understand I got to eat, I got to live, I got to wear, I got to do what I got to do to survive. And you're praying, the week is running out, and nothing is happening. You come to church, probably the first two Sabbaths, you know, and... You come to church, but you don't want everybody to know that your belly rumbling. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> so, you talk about your experience, but you hope that people will understand. You don't want to be asking for any favors. But you know what happened? You're praying. It didn't seem to be working out. And then you say to yourself, well, uh, probably, just probably I, 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 can't, I can't do this Adventist thing no more. You know, I, I, I got to eat. I got to live. How can God be leading my life and I find myself bogged down in the quagmire I'm in? But you know, it, it, it's a funny thing. But I, I like to read the Bible and look at how God arranges situations in the lives of the faithful 
that ends up embarrassing the devil and bringing him glory. Say, embarrass the devil? How, is that, how does that work out? Well, well, look. Pharaoh rides out with his big army and he carries Egypt was at the head of the technological innovations in warfare at the time. Egypt carried out its best war chariots. Those with the knives spinning on either sides of the wheel. That was the latest technology in Egyptian warfare, in African warfare, because Egypt is Africa. Egypt was the big dog in the community at the time. And Pharaoh brought out his crack troops. Because as far as he was concerned, it was not just this fellow Moses. This fellow Moses had shown up talking about God says to tell you and God says to tell you and God says to tell you. But you got to understand in Egyptian theology, Pharaoh is the impersonation of the sun god Ra. In other words, Pharaoh himself is God. And so when Pharaoh gathered his chariots, he gathered the ones with the golden trimmings because gold was a symbol of the, the rays of the sun. And it was going to be Pharaoh in his best sun god impersonation, Pharaoh in his golden armor leading his troops because it was going to be God versus God. I am going to go show that Hebrew. I'm bigger than what he's dealing with. And when Pharaoh realized that they had turned off the highway into the cul-de-sac, he just smiled to himself. You ever see a cat catch a rat and, you know, he's playing with him before he kill him? You, you, you ever see a cat playing with a rat before he kill him? Uh, Moses my, and the Israelites are in the cul-de-sac and when Pharaoh realizes that they're in the cul-de-sac, he realizes there's nowhere for them to go. Pharaoh just sees back and he's just smiling with the cat there. <laughs> Look at them. Maybe this is where God brings them. Oh man, I thought he was better than that. And so when Pharaoh saw it, Pharaoh, Pharaoh abandoned all, all caution and precaution because as far as he's concerned, they are totally helpless. They're at his mercy. And he moves in, and as, and as he's moving in, the Israelites saw fierce chariots coming, and they're crying out to Moses, you brought us out here to have us slaughtered. But God was in charge. And I want to let you know, in spite of what's happening in your life, God is still in charge. And if you hold fast your faith to the end, the Bible says, he that endures to the end, the same will be saved. It is not about what you're going through. It is that you remain faithful in it. Are you with me? Because as long as you still have the cord of faith in your hand, your bell is still ringing in heaven. Are you with me? God will answer. He may not come when you want him. But he will be there right on time. Not in the way you want him to, but in the way that his sovereign will determines is for your best good. So, man, when the, when the Israelites saw the Egyptians coming, they were saying, Lord, why don't you just wipe them out? God says, no, no, let them come and let, let them assemble. <laughs> let them assemble. And Pharaoh lined up and God says, let's give him full opportunity to put his army in array. So God dropped a curtain of darkness between Israel and Egypt. And can I tell you, brethren, Sometimes it seems as though you're living in this world defenseless. Sometimes it seems you're on your own. But can I say to you that if you walk in the counsel of the Lord, if you walk in the word of the Lord, if you walk in the will of the Lord, the Lord will fulfill his promise. Amen. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The angel of the Lord encamps around about them that fear him. God drew his curtain. And to the Egyptians it was darkness. 
But in the camp of Israel, it was light. Can I tell you, sometimes people see you going through something, and they say, but look at him now. Why doesn't he just give up this Christian thing? But to the unbeliever looking on, all he can see is absolute darkness. But to the believer who is holding in a faith relationship with God, though to the eyes of everyone it just looks stormy, in your heart there is peace. He can't see how you have peace. But the Bible declares you shall keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. So, <laughs> there is Moses. And God says, Moses, don't you worry. There is a reason why Pharaoh and his army are out here. They belong in this picture. Because I have carried them out here that I will get my honor upon them. Mm -mm. So all night, there's a curtain of darkness. And it's hemmed in the Egyptians. They can't see to do a thing. But all this time, there's light. The same curtain that is dark to the Egyptians is light to Israel. And while the Egyptians are in darkness, not being able to see a thing, God is busy working things out for his people. Can I tell you, my friend? It's not about the state of the world. It is not about how things look. It is about what God can do. Are you with me? And as they were there, the night is wearing away, but God sends a strong wind. And he divides the ocean, as he says to Moses, Moses, lift up your rod. And as Moses lifts up the rod, there is God. He divides the sea. And as he divides the sea, he says, Moses, send the people across. God has opened up a highway through the Red Sea. My friend, you know, sometimes we would prefer not to have problems. I mean, I would have much preferred that nothing went wrong with treasure. But I, 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 I say, well, if this is what the Lord allows to happen, then, then, then there's got to be a testimony in it somewhere. Amen. There's got to be purpose in your pain. Are you following what I'm saying to you? Amen. I mean, so, 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 so her mom said to me at a point, she said, said, Robbie, I don't know what God is doing, but what I want to do is document every moment. So you take a picture of everything the doctors bring in. You take a picture of it all because when we are finished, then we have assembled all the details. Probably we may not see what is working out just today, but when you step back and look at the picture, you got to say, what a God. Are you following what I'm saying to you? So, so there they are, and, and, and God divides the sea. And the same thing that God uses to deliver his people, he's going to use to destroy the army that's coming after them. And the sea opens, and as the sea opens, the Israelites go marching in. And now they're happy. Before they were just saying, you brought us out here to kill us off. Now they're happy, man, they're going through, they're going through, they're going through. And they reach, all of them. With all that they took out of Egypt, every man, woman, and child. And you know, we like to see those pictures and we think that they were riding on camels. But back in those early days, camels had not yet been introduced into the desert system. It was donkeys. Donkeys were the primary mode of transportation. So you imagine all those, ee-haw, ee-haw. And all the donkeys have made it across. All the little ones have made it across. And after they've made it across, God does something. He pulls the curtain of darkness. It's funny, you know, how sometimes to the person outside, it looked like you just moved from being in adversity to being suddenly so blessed. But you don't understand it's a process. 
all the time that they were looking at you and they thought that nothing was going on, God was busy working it out. You're not with me. Uh, because they didn't see what happened one, two, three, four. But God can change your situation just like that. And so though you don't see where deliverance is going to come from, I am saying to you, hold on, cast not away your confidence because you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you shall reap <laughs> if you faint not. You're not with me. So here they are, the curtain lifts, and the next thing they see it's this massive highway. They don't know where it came from. And when they look, the Israelites are on the other side. <laughs> Pharaoh says, I don't know how that happened, but that road, we're going on it. And so he says to his troops, charge. But that road was constructed for people of faith. That road was constructed for people in a covenant relationship with God. And when the Egyptians decided to occupy the king's highway, an angel swooped down and hung a sign, road closed. And the columns of water that had embraced the new pathway just, just suddenly clapped their hands together. And Pharaoh and his army were gobbled up in the depths of the sea. It was all over and done with. Just like that. You will not have to fight for yourself if you stand up for Jesus. Because God has said he will fight your battle. And the evidence was on the seashore, chariot wheels, pieces, and all that, all that military technology that the Egyptians gathered up, you know, their nice spears and swords that they carried with them because they were going to use it to cut up the Israelites, you know what happened? When the waves came rolling in, all those swords just washed up on the shore, and the Israelites just collect them and said, we'll use this to fight in Canaan. So now they left with all the goods and now they've gotten military equipment like bread from heaven. <laughs> and they are on the seashore and they're singing, Oh, the Lord has triumphed gloriously. Fear and his army has been thrown in the sea. And you look at these people and you say, no matter what else happened in their lives, they're going to trust God. That's what you say, right? You say, after such a marvelous miracle, after they've gone to the mountaintop with God, there ain't nothing that anybody can say or do that will cause them to doubt God. But come with me. Exodus 15. This is the next big incident. Exodus 15. So, here we are. Come with me and let's start reading in verse 22. They just finished having... A big praise service. They have just left the prior meeting. The Bible says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days. It's not a long time. Three days in the wilderness. And found no water. <laughs> Have mercy. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And they tell me that even to this day, the Bidians who occupy that area that was identified as the waters of Mara, they say there is in that region no water worthy to drink in all the springs in the east. It's not that you don't have springs, you know. You got springs. But the water is so awful that not even donkeys would drink it. 
And the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Now, let me tell you something. Donkeys can survive between three and four days without water, without a drop of water. But cattle, you keep your cattle without water for a day. After day two, they begin to drop like flies. Are you seeing what's going on? And so the Israelites are looking at their cows. And the cows are going, no, oh, oh, oh. they can't even make a good bellow. The little ones, you know, when people travel into the wilderness, they usually take their leather pouches and they fill them with water. The leather pouches of water that they carried from Egypt is about to run out. You know, let me tell you, when things are great, church is rocking, eh? Full of praises. When you still have water left in your leather pouch and your camels are fat, it is nice to praise the Lord. Well, guess what happened? The real test comes when the leather pouch is now empty. And your cows look woozy. And your donkeys are about to faint. When the means of production and provision, when your resources seem to disappear under the cruel heat of life, then we find out, do you really mean to praise the Lord? The people murmured, against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? You, Moses. Remember, at the sea, they had said, you carried us out here to kill us off. We'd have preferred to have stayed there and eaten big food. And now they said, okay. So we got past this water. And you think that's a big deal. But right now, we're about to die for thirst. What's the use of a magical highway through the sea if we're going to die of thirst in three days anyway? Take all this back and give us back Egypt. Let me tell you something. There is a something when you are half-hearted in your devotion to God. When we do not have a wholehearted commitment, it is the easiest thing to turn around and say, God ain't done nothing for me. When even the mouth you're using to say it, if God didn't give you the strength, you couldn't even say a word. The breath you used to curse him, the body you used to dishonor him, the strength that you use to accomplish the violence of sin is provided by the hand of a merciful God. The people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Verse 25. But Moses has learned what has he learned? When problems are big down here, Moses, you are not the measure of these problems, but you serve a God. He sent you on a mission, and the God who has sent you on a mission is always able to provide the resource to get the job done. Amen? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. <laughs> which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Now they tell me that there are particular trees in the desert that can be used to sweeten bitter waters. Now, they have done the examination of the geographical area and they find no such trees growing in the region of what we call Mara. And some say, well, the trees could have been growing there in the time of Moses and... Uh, you know, a lot have happened between then and now, and some of those trees could have been destroyed, and there's just none in the area anymore, but they were there then. So it could have just been, you know, that kind of tree that helps out the situation. But I believe this here is a supernatural intervention. Are you with me? And even if it were an ordinary tree, Moses never saw that tree until God showed it to him. Are you with me? 
when God showed Moses the tree, he had a solution. Can I tell you something? The whole world was locked up in the bitter waters of sin. Oh yes, we were there fainting and ready to die. But God introduced the tree. Amen. The Bible tells me cursed is he that hangs on a tree. But on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame when we were at the end of our line. And we could not find a solution to sweeten the bitter waters of our lives. From Calvary's hill, there came a cry, it is finished. And in that moment, all our sorrows, there became the possibility for all our sorrows to be turned to joy, for all our pains to be turned into testimonies and comforts. Yes. Though it seemed that all was lost, the Bible says he cried unto the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made them for a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. God says to them, what did he say? I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Friends, satisfaction in this life is not going to come by any other means. And by trusting in Jesus. Because the promises of this world are like cotton candy. Anybody know cotton candy? The promises of this world are like cotton candy. It looks nice and fluffy. You know, you get that thing. I, 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 when the candy man came in, 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 into the elementary school and he would he, he'd put the stick in his candy machine and he'd move the stick around and, you know, an empty stick went in and when the thing came out, it had this big puffy thing and, and depending on the flavors, pink and white and blue and fluffy and lovely. And you look at it. Oh man, you just... Uh -huh. Big thing, you think you'll get big thing? And by the time you touch it, your tongue get melt away. <laughs> While it's happening, it's sweet. And then you look, and you know, and, and, uh, uh, Brother Clark, I thought I should have gotten more for my money, you know. <laughs> so, so, so the stick is empty. And I'm kind of looking at the guy, I'm saying, saying where's the rest of it? <laughs> That's the way the world is. You think you've gotten it all. And in a moment, it's down to a dry stick. But I tell you, the Bible instructs me, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth doth not corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. If you lay up yourselves treasures in heaven, my friend, those are treasures that will never pass away. God said to Israel, if you'll give ear to my commandments, keep all my statutes, I'll put none of these diseases upon you, which I've brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. What's the record? What's the record? I want to close very quickly. I don't want you to get afraid of me. Exodus chapter 23 God says, so you shall serve the Lord your God. And he will what? Bless your bread and your water. Can I tell you? I'm not telling you it's always going to be easy. But I'm telling you, God ain't going to leave you in the lurch. Are you with me this morning? It may seem as though things may have tumbled right side up, upside down. 
And then we find out that if we stay in the will of God, he'll work it out. If you abide my commands, he says, so you shall serve the Lord, your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. Not just that. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. What was the testimony? This was a promise God gave them. After they, he gave them water, he gave them this promise. What did he promise them? I'll heal you. What is the testimony? Does God fulfill his promise? Psalm 105 verse 37, what does it say? There was not one feeble person among their tribes. For 40 years they lived in the wilderness and they never got sick. And you know what was amazing about it? They had one pair of shoes and it never wore out. 40 years. Anybody here have a 40 year old pair of shoes that's still good? So, I'm closing quickly, but God made a specific promise. I'll put none of the diseases upon you, which I put upon the children of Egypt, if you will keep my commands. So, there was a study done on the mummies of Egypt because there was a desire to find out what was God really promising. A team of specialists from around the world gathered in 1975 for the express purpose of performing autopsies on the Egyptian mummies in Manchester, England. There at the museum, they have a medical school. Uh, these mummies were examined by these specialists from around the world and these were the diseases that were found in the Egyptian mummies heart disease anybody familiar with that sounds like something happening today cancer hmm? all different kinds of vascular diseases and also among the Egyptian mummies they found arthritis <laughs> God said I'll put none of the diseases found among the Egyptians upon you. For 40 years, they're in the wilderness. No heart disease, no cancer, no kind of vascular disease, no arthritis. But then it gets better than that. In 1522, not long before the birth of Moses, there was a famous medical book written in Egypt called The Papyrus of Eber. Now, this book lists a, a set of remedies or cures for a host of diseases, infections, and accidents, very few of which you'd probably like to use. But I want to share with you a couple of things. What happened in the medical records of Egypt? Now, if you had a bald head, anybody with a bald head? If you're losing here and you were in Egypt in this period... Here is the solution that doctors of Egypt would have provided. Rub into the scalp a tonic. Here is the formula. Tonic made from horses, horse hoofs and a bush called dog heel boiled in oil. And you rub that and you are supposed to get here. Growing again. Well, probably that was not as interesting to you. Huh? <laughs> but think about it. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 7, Brother Jack, don't try that, you hear? <laughs> the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 7 and verse 22, that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt. And yet, when we read the five books of Moses, there is not present in the instructions that Moses gave Israel any of the foolishness that we find in the papyrus of Eber. His writings are filled with instruction concerning sanitation. When you read Leviticus Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses gives instruction on sanitation, personal hygiene, nutrition. 
but not once, not even once, did he refer to any of the cures that the Egyptian doctors prescribed, even though he was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt. So where did Moses get this knowledge from? I believe it was from the God who told him what his name is. You see, God designed our bodies. He knows how we can avoid diseases and keep our bodies at optimum performance. I'm going to close real quickly, but I'm closing with this story. There's a young man. He really liked the idea of owning a car, and he worked all he could. And he really wanted to buy a nice car, Brother Cameron, one of those really nice V12 turbo engines. You know what I mean? He wanted, he wanted something that, 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 that would displace over 600 horsepower. He, he wanted something that would, 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 would really stick to the pavement. You know, he, he wanted something. That, that didn't stop at five gears. That, he wanted a car that was, 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 was no ordinary car, and he worked real hard. And he got it. He bought it. Nice, shiny red. It was pretty. But he liked driving. He really liked driving. But he didn't like reading. You know what I mean? So as far as he was concerned, I know how to operate a car. I don't need to read the manufacturer's instruction. The car is turn it on and drive. <laughs> so, I mean, every day he jumped in and he would drive his car, really. Yeah, he, he wanted his friends to see him. And you know, when he, when, he, when he got onto the main boulevard, he would pull off to the side of the road and he'd touch his button and, and the drop top would roll away and he'd just smile. And everybody was seeing him in his pretty car and he just, he just loved everybody seeing him in his pretty car and it, it was really fulfilling to him. And he really liked to show what his car could do and he would, he would, he would, he would get on, he'd get on a nice piece of road yeah, where there was a lot of traffic and, and you know, he would just wait until there was a little bit of space and he, his zero to 60 was awesome. Just fly around the place. And he kept on doing this over and over and over. He didn't bother to, to check on the fuels or the brakes or, I mean, it's a great car. I mean, this is, you know, it's a mighty car. What could go wrong? Do, need I tell you what happened? Oh, you need me to tell you. My friend, God, the great God, it's made you marvelous. You're special. You're not ordinary. You're unique. Are you with me? The Bible says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God has some basic instructions for your life. And in his ten principles, God has outlined how to live an abundantly satisfying life. Following his principles, it won't always be easy. Sometimes you may end up in a cul-de-sac like Israel. Sometimes your water may run out of your leather pouch. Sometimes it may seem as though your cows are dying and your donkeys are about to collapse. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Run and not be wary. Walk and not faint. Friend, you can either live for the cotton candy of this world, or you can live by the will and the word and the plan of God. Amen. You know what he says? Daniel tells me that after everything has collapsed, the kingdom and dominion under the whole heavens shall be given 
to the saints of the Most High. Amen. Sister Matthew didn't have any idea how the sermon was going to be presented today. But she went to Revelation 22 this morning, and when I saw her text, I just smiled. I smiled. I'm going to close. Stand with me. I've said, I've referenced closing so many times, and I'm still standing, that if I didn't ask you to stand, you'd probably think he's not serious. Revelation 22, verse 14. What does it say? Blessed are they that do his commandments. They are the ones who will have what? Right to the tree of life and enter through the gates into the city. God will not force you to be obedient. For 10 plagues, he tried to persuade Egypt. For 10 plagues. And Egypt would not be persuaded. What else does God have to do in your life for you to give him his due? What else? What else must God do to persuade you that he's worthy to be praised? You could choose. You could choose to be among the camp marching according to the will and the word of God. Or you could choose to be buried in the depths of the sea. And trust me, that's not going to be water. It's going to be fire. And that's not because God doesn't love you. It is because you would have resisted his love. None will be lost because they couldn't be saved. Anyone lost will be lost because they refuse to be saved. The devil is like Pharaoh. He conducts hostile takeovers, but God is a God of love and mercy.